Hey guys, on today's episode, we're working on a BMW 5 Series, which is by far the worst car I've ever done in my entire career. I've actually brought in some heavy hitters here. I got Dan from Turn 7, and I have Tom from Simon Eyes Garage. We have a whole lot of work. We actually have to disassemble the interior. Here's why. You have some dirty cars, you have some really dirty cars, and then you have cars that are so disgusting and so bad that insurance companies actually total them, meaning that it's, it's junk right now, it's being thrown away. So. We're gonna do everything we can to revive this, bring it back to life. This is the next level sort of detail and we're taking it pretty seriously. We're gonna be putting on uh, masks and of course uh, full outfits here, but that and a whole lot more coming up on this absolutely disgusting episode of Drive and Protect. So this is a Cars for Kids donation vehicle and clearly not worth the cost of the detail. So why are we doing it? Well, we're doing it because the car is actually in decent condition in terms of the integrity of the material, meaning there's no rips or holes. However, the mold in urine is making it unsafe to allow mechanics to go inside and disassemble the vehicle for its parts, which in turn is preventing it from going to auction for those parts and being sold for charity. So when I saw this car and understood the backstory or what was preventing it from being auctioned off, I thought it could be a great car to learn the process of an almost complete disassembly to get a better understanding of the time, tools, and labor required for such a daunting task without testing it on a real customer's car, all of which will be tallied at the end of the episode to understand the true cost if you decide to provide this to a customer in the future or to sell your own junk car for parts. Plus, I wanted to test out my first ever usage of chlorine dioxide in a car that would be the benchmark for all future smelly cars. In other words, if it worked here, anything's possible, but let's just see how much time it will take from start to finish. As you can see, the interior is covered in mold, germs, and multiple mouse nests. Oh, dude. <laughs> Now, in terms of smell, it's a bit cliche to say that it stunk or it made me gag, etc. Dead animals, spoiled milk, and forgotten shellfish is obviously a bad smell, and they weren't in this car. But you can just swallow the lump in your throat when you're working on those and just move on with the interior job. This interior, however, was way different because it's extremely dangerous. It's a different type of smell. So if you're within two to three feet when the doors are closed, you can actually smell it. Now, when the doors are open, if you're six feet away, you can still smell it. As we were getting the game plan together, we needed to do a quick inspection. We obviously had to wear full PPE gear because of the excessive mold colonies. Now, mold is a type of fungi which can result in discoloration or a fuzzy appearance, as you can see here on the seat back. Aside from the slow biodegradation of the material, certain molds can cause diseases as a result of the allergic sensitivity to the mold spores, growth of these mold spores within the human body, or from general inhalation of the toxic compounds produced and released by the mold. Common symptoms are skin irritation, lung infections, asthma, nasal congestion, fever, and so on. The bottom line is this, it's not something you want to deal with in the act of disassembling the car to sell it for its parts. So what I needed to do was call Tom Palancia from Simon Eyes Garage for a bit of advice once we pulled the car inside and then loaded the trunk. So step number one is to actually remove everything from the interior of the car. But it's not safe for us as detailers to even get in there right now, that's how bad it is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a chlorine dioxide uh, tablet treatment, which will actually kill off all those microorganisms. We'll take the, the jar, we'll fill it up with about four ounces of water. We'll use a tablet, which once it's exposed to water, will create chlorine dioxide gas. A chlorine dioxide efficiency system, just gonna speed up the process. If I were to just put the tablet in the water, it would take a couple hours. By using this, it'll take about 20 minutes. Then we're going to take the car surface sanitizer and disinfectant, and we're just going to spray any surface that we can see. Let it sit for about 10 minutes, and then it'll be safe for us to start the detail process. We ended up putting two containers in the vehicle, one in the cabin area and one in the trunk. Once the tablet was introduced to the water, the gas it released is a yellowish green color and is known as an oxidizing agent and is commonly used as a bleach. Believe it or not, this was actually discovered in the early 1800s and used for bleaching paper during the manufacturing process, as well as water treatment for producing drinking water. More recently, chemists have evolved its application to food processing, disinfection of vehicles, which we can relate to here, mold eradication, again, we can relate to here, treatment of swimming pools, and wound cleansing, to name just a few. 
While we were waiting for the gas to do its work, we removed the engine insulation to reveal another mouse nest inside before removing the third one behind the engine and along the firewall. Next, we removed the caked up leaves and branches before vacuuming up the hard to reach areas. Checking on the interior, you can now see the inside has become smoky or foggy after just about 15 minutes. Yeah, so it's smoking. It's like, it's almost like it's fogging the whole inside of the car. After 20 minutes or so, we opened the doors and noticeable gas was released from the cabin, but at the same time, the smell was gone. Not like sort of gone, but gone, gone. Same thing in the trunk. However, we continued to wear our PPE gear throughout the process, especially as we made physical contact with the material. Phase two of the pre-cleaning was to hit all the surfaces with a disinfectant to give ourselves the safest working environment possible before using standard detailing techniques. For more information on the step-by-step -step process for disinfecting your car during COVID, click the link above. Next, we disassembled the interior piece by piece and put them outside for a thorough scrubbing. Later on that evening, Steve from across the street could smell us and decided to come over and help speed up the interior removal process so that he could, quote, get this thing off of our street. <laughs> As you can see, with the seats out, the mold and growth was out of control. Check out the oxidation on the coins. They were actually stuck to the carpets. Next, we focused on the center console, removed all the plastic trim, the gas pedal, and the carpets, including the trunk mat, which was actually physically heavy from the weight of the urine from the mice back there, spare tire and the parts associated, the rear carpeted trim, and the back window sill cover. Again, when we did that, we revealed yet another mouse nest. The next day with all the parts outside and in the driveway, Dan, Tom, and myself rinsed, scrubbed, and dried all the parts. Now with the center console and the doors disassembled, there were a ton of little parts everywhere that needed to be cleaned front and backside. To do this, Dan first used a strong all-purpose cleaner and several small brushes to agitate the grime, then power washed each piece individually. Tom focused on the floor mats and the carpets while I scrubbed the doors and the seats. If you haven't been introduced to your neighbors yet, this is a really good way to break the ice.
After each cleaning, we place the freshly scrubbed pieces in the sun to dry for two days after toweling, wet backing, and compressed air drying. Notice the back carpet. The right side or the driver's side rear mat seems much more stained than the passenger side. Clearly there's a huge before and after, but why here? More on this later. Hey, if you enjoy restoration or preservation episodes, be sure to subscribe to Ammo NYC, where we find and preserve rare, forgotten, or just neglected cars with tools and tricks you can use on your car at home. And if you're a super nerd or professional, subscribe to the all new Ammo NYC studio page for more in-depth professional detailing tips, interviews, and behind the scenes footage. Don't forget to turn on the notification bell for the latest how-to car care videos. With everything cleaned both back and front and now drying, we pushed the metal carcass outside and blew out the caked up door jams and seals, vacuumed the remaining mouse poop, scrubbed the metal frame to discourage future mold from underneath, scrubbed and power washed pretty much everything else on the outside as well. Now with the car a couple hundred pounds lighter, Dan foamed with Ammo Brute to get into the creases and seams while I scrubbed the decades of BMW brake dust off the wheel. After a thorough washing, next Dan cleaned the paint and then removed stubborn sap with rapid remover before power washing yet again to continually flush out the compacted rain rails and drainage, which leads me to my previous discovery. So we are wrapping up uh, the cleaning of the exterior on the BMW. Clearly you can see that the window sill is probably the cause for the mold inside the car. It's leaking around here and all up uh, in this area here, and you can look at the seals, they're cracked, the back is cracked. That's basically uh, one of the major reasons that lots of cars have this issue, but if you compound it with the fact that I think this sat for a long period of time, so you have the leaking window sitting for a long period of time, that combination creates a disaster inside. With day three coming to a close, we pushed the BMW back inside and began the process of reassembling the buttons and handles within each door. Now the first door took about 15 minutes or so and the other is much less once we organized the various parts. The most challenging aspect of reassembling was probably installing the doors without breaking those white tabs. So be gentle here if you decide to remove any panels on your job. Next, the carpets, the seats, center console, and so on was reinstalled inside the vehicle. Okay guys, check this out. Remember we talked about the window uh, leaking here? This makes a lot more sense if you pull in, take a look. That's the worst spot in the entire uh, carpet. And underneath here was really wet. So there was a spot there and there was a spot there. And now that makes a bit more sense because if this is leaking here, it's dripping down when the doors close, probably running down here, catching this little spot and then seeping and sort of seeping back uh, to this direction over here. That is the worst spot makes a bit more sense now as we're starting to piece this all together and put the jigsaw puzzle uh, is kind of telling a little bit of a story about that particular area on the, on the BMW here. So at this point, if you're asking yourself, why the heck would I fully reassemble instead of just throwing all the cleaned pieces on the floorboard if it's being sold for parts? Now, that's a fair question. Number one, I wanted to go through the beginning all the way to the end process to feel the true pain and understand the true cost of doing this if I was actually gonna do it on a customer car. And two, because I'm shooting a video, it would feel a bit anticlimactic if I just threw all the clean parts on the floor or in the trunk or whatever. Plus, I think it would sell better if it looks clean and reassembled at auction. Again, that's just a guess. With the seats and center console in and the jumper pack on the battery, we tested the functionality of the reassembled parts and we were looking pretty good. 
So we started the next phase of the cleaning with lather on the areas that did not get removed, like the steering wheel, the dashboard, cup holders, and so on. This also included the headliner. However, just about this time, a special guest arrived at the studio for tomorrow's wet sanding job. He came in a little bit earlier. Now this wet sanding job is on a 911 and the car is from the Audrain Museum. You gotta watch the video, it's crazy. This of course is one of my closest friends, Jason Rose from Rupes USA. In true Jason fashion, not one to sit around, he hopped in and gave us a hand on the headliner. Yeah, so Larry, I understand why we didn't take this uh, headliner out. I mean, it makes sense. But we can clean this up a little bit and make it look better for the auction. I guess this car is going to auction, right? That's yeah. correct. So um, what we've learned is there's a way to use our Rupus Course wool cutting pad, which would normally be purpose for polishing on paint. Yeah. But it actually does a fantastic job when combined with, with a large orbit. This is a 12 millimeter orbital tool. So it agitates in there and does a fantastic job of loosening up, you know, stains and cleaning up. But in a up. safe way, so we're not like, if I were to use a rotary, let's say, yeah. you'd be twisting it and kind of... Yeah, so the, the movement of the tool is great for this, but also what we're doing is not saturating the headliner too much. Right. Some people just spray chemicals on there and then you end up delaminating the headliner. So we're gonna put this on uh, we apply the chemical to the pad, not the headliner, for the reasons we just mentioned. We don't want to saturate this too much. Uh, and then you just go over these stains and take a towel, microfiber towel, and pull that stain out of the material. While Jason and Dan worked on the headliner, I continued cleaning the center console and shifter boot with an interior brush. And with the inside nearly done, Jason showed me his newest compounds, pads, and tools to freshen up the paint with the new Rupes DA system. And in particular, we used the Uno One Step and Protect used with the blue wool pad so that we could cut, finish, and protect the paint all in one step, which is absolutely perfect for large volume detail shops, but at the same time, it's also good for time-crunched driveway DIYers. I'll have a step-by-step -step video coming soon, or check out the studio channel for a behind-the-scenes tutorial from Jason coming soon. First thing we need to do to prepare this pad to do its thing is we need to prime this pad. <laughs> With the paint polished and the headlights sanded, compounded, and polished, the before and after was huge. Finally, we remove the biohazard sign on the glass, representing its stay of execution from the car crusher and its new life back up on the auction block. So as promised, here's the math. Over the course of three days, we accumulated roughly 64.5 hours between three guys, excluding Jason's surprise visit at the end to help. I also quickly researched eBay Motors for the cheapest similar BMW at about $6,000. Now, is ours worth about 6K? No, but it's a good point of reference being the cheapest one that I can find on the internet. My guess is it's worth about maybe half of the cheapest eBay one, buy it now price. So call it $3,000 for argument's sake. So let's work the math out a little bit here. 64.5 hours at an arbitrary $40 per hour is approximately 2,600 bucks. We used approximately $48 of towels, chemicals, power, water, and sandpaper. Plus I'm adding a tax of about 250 bucks for tying up the lift for three days with a horrific smell in the studio. The total is about $2,900 for a car that's worth about $3,000. So not really a good investment if you were the owner. However, there's a loophole in the system. It's called the used parts market. For example, headlights off a crashed 5 Series on eBay are about $390, which is about 15% of the total value of the car, and they're not even polished. So my point is this, although to the public, this seems like a waste of money, and in most cases, 
You make a fair point. But to the used parts market, the door, the handles, the headlights, the seats, the buttons, and so on are worth way more as parts than they are as a functioning vehicle. Heck, the back seat is $250 alone. One seat belt buckle is 15 bucks. And again, so on. All the individual parts are added up. You can actually make really good money on junk cars. To find out if parting your car is the right move for you, check out the link in the description for pullapart.com. Well, guys, we're all done and the car looks amazing, but more importantly, I'm standing here without a mask and my eyes aren't watering. That is a huge accomplishment. A huge thank you to Tom from Simon Eyes for helping us out in the beginning there. Uh, Dan from Turn 7, of course, and Jason Rose at the very end helping us with the paint. Uh, we have a lot of exciting episodes. He's going to be here for a couple of days helping us out. But if you guys have any questions, you know where to find me. As always, thanks for watching and be well.